Okay, cool. That's really helpful. Thank you so much for uh, doing that poll. That helps me. All right, so I want to start off um, on climate science with asking you some questions about what you know already. And I Professor, put together. Yep. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but is it? Uh, are we able to record this? Yes. Any anyone who wants to record this is welcome to record. I'm actually recording it myself. Um, so uh, I just I should have probably announced that at the beginning. Um, I'm recording it. If anyone doesn't want me to record you, just let me know at the end, and I will um, delete it. But I'm hopeful you can that delete it. I can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. our portraits, right? No, I have it. to delete the whole thing. So. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, um, so, yeah, feel, yeah. Did you did you get a little icon at the beginning of the sem seminar that asks you to video record and notifying you that it's okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everyone, so this is being video recorded, and um, if you don't want to be re video recorded, leave the call right now. <laughs> okay. Or you can turn <laughs> your uh, camera off, right? Or turn your camera off. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now in this uh, seminar, um, I'm. Normally, I would actually have students go into breakout rooms and maybe have a, 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 a some kind of problem to solve, but the format of this is basically we're going to go ninety minutes and we're gonna we're gonna go through the science of climate. Okay, cool. Are you guys ready? Fasten your seatbelts. We're about to go on a rocket ship on space deck to the International Space Station. All right, here we go. So um, I want to start off uh, with my website that I came up with, um, and in that website. Um, I put together a lot of vocabulary for my students. So uh, actually there's one question which I didn't ask you, which is what is your level of English? And so I think, uh, young -Hoo, is it, would it be fair to say that most people here are pretty good at English? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna skip the vocabulary, um, but we are gonna be talking about some technical terms, um, something called PPM, everyone, parts per million. This is really important because this is how a lot of things are measured in science, especially with um, greenhouse gases. Um, another one are metric tons, or uh, um, we're going to talk about gigatons, which are, are millions of metric tons and billions, and uh, also um, some other things. So let's come over here. And I want to start with the IPCC. Everyone, the, I, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, if you have heard of this, would you just kindly uh, raise your hand uh, just so I can see? The IPCC. Great. It's really wonderful if I can see your faces and interact with you uh, because um, if I can't see you and I can't see, I, it's hard for me to actually cater my lecture towards what you're interested in. Cool. So the IPCC was put together in the 1980s um, at the request of the United Nations and member governments. And what they did was uh, they wanted to address this issue of climate change because uh, uh, they could see that the earth is warming and they have what are called assessments. And these assessments are done on maybe like a, a six to seven year um, uh, break. Um, it's not exactly six or seven years. There's actually many reports coming out during that time, but the main assessments are at different years. And you can see here, the first one was in 1990. Um, the second one was in 1995, um, 2001, and then 2007, 2014. And now the sixth assessment is coming out in 2022. Now um, there are three books and you can find it in the UML library. Um, I don't think Sinchon has one, but you don't need one. You can click on these links if you have access to this um, and you can have a PDF file of it. And believe me, the PDF file is so much lighter than the actual books. The books are like, if you stack the books, they're like that thick and they're super heavy. You, you really don't want to carry them in your backpack. So um, the, the first book is the physical basis of the science. And that is the physics of climate, uh, of uh, the science, the physics of, you know, going into the atmosphere, into the land, the carbon sinks, and also into the oceans. And then you have here mitigation. Uh, mitigation means how do we um, stop it? Um, how, do we, how do we slow it down? 
And then ad adaptation means you can't really stop it or slow it down. You're just gonna have to like go with the flow. And that is how are we gonna go with the flow? Um, and so there, there are these three, if you're looking at solutions, you're probably mostly interested in these. If you're looking at science, you're more interested in this. Okay, now it's highly, highly technical. Um, and so if you're reading it, um, it's, it's a real incredible uh, lesson. My brother is a contributor to the fifth assessment. He's a biogeochemist. And I would say that um, uh, the science is very solid in the IPCC reports. Now, I wanna stop and, and just mention briefly that there is a lot of um, fossil fuel propaganda that attacks the IPCC and tries to confuse people about the science and that the science is somehow debatable. And actually, um, it's not. There's a, there's a consensus of about 97% of scientists who believe that three things. Number one, the earth is warming. Number two, it's humans. And number three, it's greenhouse gases. Okay. And that there is a 97% consensus, uh, probably even higher than that, uh, that says this is so. And I would say it's up there with uh, the theory of relativity and also gravity. <laughs> so it's very hard to debate it. But if you have a lot of money and you want to confuse the public, there's no uh, stopping uh, that in America. So this is the present uh, IPCC chair. He's South Korean economist. His name is Lee Hwesung. And he uh, is kind of leading the IPCC right now. And so these are the key facts. Um, I mentioned these already, uh, but we should also think that um, we have to keep uh, the temperature of the earth below 2C, okay? And uh, actually, really, we need to keep it below one and a half C if we really wanna be safe. And uh, a good solution is to generate as much renewable energy as possible. And also, Another good solution is to electrify everything. So these two solutions right here are the way in which to achieve this solution right here. And so basically electrify everything and get as much renewable energy as you can. And I, I wanna say this also, it's not, there, there are four sectors um, that we're gonna be looking at with regards to carbon emissions. The four sectors are number one, and these are in order of difficulty to decarbonize. Uh, industry is the hardest to decarbonize. Then buildings. Then we have uh, transportation. And the easiest to decarbonize is electricity. Okay. So we have, again, industry, buildings, transportation, and electricity. Food is in industry. And, and actually that's in the IPCC report. They divide it in the same way. So it's not me just saying, oh, let's just divide this. I'm actually taking this from the IPCC itself. All right, so let's, let's move to the next. Um, the next thing I wanna share with you is a little bit about NASA. And, you know, um, I did say we're gonna go on a spaceship, you know, in um, a SpaceX rocket. Uh, before we actually talk about this, I wanna actually give you a little poll which kind of tests your knowledge on um, our uh, adventure here. So um, what I'm gonna do is give you another poll. And in that poll, I want you to answer the questions again, but these are gonna be a little bit harder than the questions that I just gave you before. So um, let's see here, here we go. All right, good luck. I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes. It shouldn't take you long. Don't worry if you don't know, because by the end of this, you're gonna know. And Young Hu, I, I'm really, you, you have to get all of these correct because you had my class before, so. These are just some basic questions. There's a lot more I could have asked you, but I just wanted to keep it simple. 
I didn't want to smash your self-confidence. And, you know, don't worry, you don't have to be correct. Just go ahead and if you know it, you know it. If you don't, you don't. And we'll just uh, do our best. Watching all the numbers come in. Okay, all right. So we just have, uh, I think, four students who haven't finished yet. So as, as we have the other students come in, I'm gonna go back and we're gonna kinda go through this. Um, here we go. So um, NASA has a website. Uh, it's called um, NASA, climatenasa.gov. And I'd like you to open up your browser right now and go to it. You'll see exactly this. And if you ever are wondering about Earth's vital signs, you can come to this wonderful website. And I like this website because everyone knows NASA. Um, it's just like SpaceX or Tesla um, or the IPCC. It's a very reliable, uh, top, uh, best-in-class scientists in the world. And they put this together, despite the Trump administration, to really educate people about um, where we are. And you'll see here that they have carbon dioxide. Uh, I see. No, you can't change your answer once you got it. So let's end the polling. Everyone did it. Great job. And now I'm going to share the answers with you. Okay. So um, here is, uh, it looks like most of you said 405 ppm. Uh, some of you said 418 ppm. And actually, uh, the answer is 413 ppm. So if you ever uh, are, and, and we're definitely not at 385 ppm. Um, actually, if you had mentioned 418 ppm, we did actually reach that. I think at, at one point during this year, it went that high. Um, but basically, um, uh, a two degree world is equivalent to about 450 ppm. So um, uh, I just want you to know that. And also, if you look here, you can see sea level rise is about 3.3 millimeters per year, not uh, 12.1 millimeters. Oh my gosh, if we were at 12.1 millimeters, we'd be in real trouble. Um, but uh, it, it goes to show you that um, when I first started studying climate change, I thought, oh my God, the water must be rising really fast. You know, we're, we're in danger, actually. It takes a long time for the ice to melt. It, you know, it's like on a hundred years time scale. So, um, but what you want to do is look at the rate of change. That's the key thing when you're talking about ice melt. It's not how many millimeters, it's the rate of change from 3.1 to 3.3 or 3.0 to 3.3. That's what you want to look at. How fast did it take that to, to happen? Cool. So this is also has global temperature. This is in Fahrenheit. I mean, like who uses Fahrenheit? I mean, like, oh my God. Yeah, my home country, the United States. So if you were to convert this to Celsius, it would be about 1.1 degrees Celsius, which means that um, we don't have a lot of time to bend the curve on global carbon emissions uh, to keep it under 1.5. And every year, I, I don't have it to, tonight, but if you ever want it, I can tell you um, there's a really great Twitter post. Actually, I can, let me, I can, actually, I can, I can do it. I can go find it right now. Um, keys. Um, this guy is one of my favorite experts in sustainable development. He's in the Netherlands. Right here, you can see this right here. Um, this is amazing. So um, it took about 12 years to go from 320 to 330. It took about um, eight years to go from 330 to 340. Six years to go from 340 to 350. Seven, uh, it looks like there was a little bit of a pause there. But then look at this. 370 to 380, five years, five years. Look at this. It only took four years to go 10 ppm from 400 to 410. Okay. And it's just happening faster and faster. All right. So um, 
Uh, I want to also mention just really quick um, uh, how many atomic bombs. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna save this one for the end. Um, I think you'll be uh, surprised. And then um, the hottest year globally on record was in 2019. True or false? False. It was actually 2016. Um, haha, gotcha. <laughs> um, but still, uh, actually. Um, if you look at, I'll show you some charts that show you that it's consistently every few years getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And it depends on which country you're in, but globally, it's been about four years since we hit that record. Okay, where is most of the ice on Earth? Very good, you guys got it. Antarctica is correct. Um, actually, Greenland would have been also a good guess. Definitely not the Arctic. Actually, when you put ice in a glass of water, uh, the water does go up. But if the ice is already in the water, like in the Arctic, it doesn't affect sea level rise. Um, also, the glaciers are a very small percentage, almost negligible for sea level rise. There are, and we'll talk more about this as we go. So, um, cool. We're gonna move on now. So uh, one of the great things that I've done um, is that I put together in 2015 when we had the Paris Climate Accord, we had a uh, uh, famous gathering in Paris and Elon Musk uh, was there and he was at the uh, Sorbonne and the Sorbonne is the Harvard of France and he gave this talk on uh, the basics of climate change and some solutions. And I took that like 25 minute video and made it into 12, less than 12 minutes. I took a lot of editing and I put in subtitles and I got about 1.4 million views. Um, and so you can watch this, I'll send you the links for this. Um, Younghu, did, you um, did you actually set up the uh, Kakao group? I think the URLs are able to copy and paste in the Zoom. Okay, let me give it a try right now. So if any of you want to watch this later, um, you can do that. And I'm just going to um, give you this link right now. Can you copy and paste that? Oh, good. Okay, wow. Okay. Zoom has changed. I guess that was a good reason for updating my Zoom. It, you couldn't used to do that before. Okay, cool. So um, uh, here we go. We'll come back. And um, this video will give you a very good basic introduction to the climate problem, which basically is that we have the carbon cycle balances over our history. Uh, carbon comes out and carbon goes back in. It goes into the oceans. It goes into the land sinks of the forests. And then it also comes out when we burn a forest or we, you know, um, uh, burn fossil fuels. And the basic problem is we have too much carbon. It's the, the cycle is out of balance. And that is because of greenhouse gases. So our job is to restore the balance of the carbon cycle. And it's not just, of course, greenhouse gases. There are other problems too, environmentally. Uh, but that's a really good basic introduction. Another good basic introduction is Al Gore. And Al Gore uh, is one of my uh, other heroes. And he has been fighting on this issue for like a long time. When I was in college, I think he was starting to actually get into this issue. So he's been at it a long time. This is a 10 minute video. I actually got his permission to use his video and upload it to YouTube. So you can watch this one as well. And I'm gonna send you the link for that. Um, so we don't have time to actually watch these videos uh, in, in our Zoom but we do have time to actually give them to you. So here's the other one. Have fun with that. Um, cool. So uh, moving on, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, greenhouse gases and which one is most dangerous. Now, it looks like most of you, uh, uh, <laughs> you shared uh, CH4. Um, actually, you're all wrong. Um, R134A is actually much, 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 much worse. What is it? It's a HCFC or what we call hydrochlorofluorocarbon. 
Um, it's the same kind of chemical that is destroying the ozone layer in the, uh, the Antarctic. Um, and uh, it's like thousands of times stronger at trapping heat and it is used in refrigeration. And so actually the top climate change solution is actually refrigeration management. How do I know what the top climate change solutions are? Um, I'll send you another link which uh, enables you to check out something called Project Drawdown. Um, Project Drawdown is, it's not letting me do this. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, Project Drawdown is the effort of scientists to peer review the top solutions for money spent in climate. So the, what they, they, they don't just look at any solution, they look at solutions that cost money and how, what's the cheapest solution for the greatest amount of effect. And refrigeration management is at the top. Pretty, pretty interesting. And that is capturing those uh, HCFCs. Now, if we were to, let me just uh, give you guys some credit. If we were to exclude HCFCs, you would have been correct. Um, CH4 is about, in its first 25 years of life, about 85 times more powerful than CO2 in trapping heat. As it degrades over time, uh, it, it, de it decreases to around 20, 25 times, and then eventually just degrades into carbon dioxide. Um, so you guys did pretty well on that, actually. High five. All right, so let's go back. And this is uh, Project Drawdown on their website. Woo. And we'll come back here. So this is the IPCC report, fifth assessment on the difference between CO2 and CH4. I like to use the metaphor of CO2 being a uh, chronic disease that kind of stays with you forever. It's like you got COVID-19 and you recovered, but you still have kidney damage and liver damage, and it's gonna affect you for the rest of your life, um, which happens in a small percentage of recovery uh, patients. Um, methane is more like a snake bite. It's like you get bitten and you can die very fast because it's so much more powerful than CO2. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I really love to tell students, and I, when, I'm, when I'm in the classroom, I'll actually hand them out uh, cups, soju glasses, because uh, a really great metaphor for understanding uh, PPM in CO2 concentrations is alcohol. Uh, uh, going into the blood of a student. So um, everybody knows that when you drink alcohol, you know, the more you drink, the more you get inebriated and you lose certain uh, functions. Well, in the United States, uh, if you have a blood chemistry of 0.08%, it's a very small amount, you cannot drive a car. It's illegal. And if you get caught, you can go to jail and lose your driver's license. Wow. So what I like to say is that small changes in biological systems can have huge effects, right? Now, this is kind of hard to grasp for many people because, you know, you go into your apartment or your dormitory room and you have the thermometer, right? And you want to change the th thermostat and, you know, oh, you know, one degree C, that's nothing, right? You think, what, what's the big deal about one degree C? You know, it's just going from like 43 to 40, 24. Well, this is confusing like a physical space with a biological system. They're very, very different. And you, you really need to understand that a biological system behaves very differently than a physical space. Um, a biological system can have a very, very small change and have a huge impact. Just notice like a small virus like the COVID-19, it can take over your whole system and kill you. So, um, but we're not talking viruses here. We're talking, you know, uh, uh, concentrations of chemicals over long periods of time. So, um, <laughs> you know, if I'll, everybody hold up your soju glass. Are you ready? All right, you got your soju glass? All right, here, I'm gonna pass around the soju. Okay, here we go. All right, uh, here's some soju in your cups, everybody. Okay, all right, everyone bottoms up. Are you ready? Go, okay. You have just gone to 0.02%, okay? You're feeling a little bit relaxed. You're like, oh, this is fun lecture. I never thought this would be this fun. Um, wow, 
Young Hu never told me about drinking in class. Um, and then uh, everyone put up your drinking glass again. Come on, I'm gonna give you a second round. Here we go, okay. Everyone, you ready? Okay, bottoms up again. All right. Okay, now you're feeling like, ooh, wow, this, this class is amazing. <laughs> Five stars. And, um, you know, your, your visual perception is starting to get a little bit affected and, you know, your reflexes are slowing down. And we're only at point, you know, zero five. Um, now we're gonna do another one, are you ready? Okay, everyone take out your soju glasses again, okay? Round number three, oh my God, this professor is crazy. Oh my God, he's still gonna get fired. All right, here we go. Um, all right, let's drink again, ready, bottoms up. Oh, oh my gosh, we're at point one, point one percent. All right, and most people here are like, you know, your attention is really distracted. You know, um, you know, you're you're kind of having slow reflexes, and you're thinking really sloppily, and you're just laughing hysterically, and you know, you just you're like, wow, okay. Now here comes the real doozy. All right, you guys, round number four. So your glasses up. Here we go, going around. Okay, come on. I know your your reflexes slow down, but it's not that slow. Okay, come on. All right, and we drink. Now you're at 0.2% and you're getting double vision, memory loss, the film was cut, as they say in Korean. Um, not able to walk, you might throw up. Um, you might, uh, you know, not be able to go to the bathroom. You might just wet your pants or something and high risk of accident. We go further and you could go into tremors, cold body and 0.4 coma and death. Okay, so uh, wow. And that's just half a percent, okay? It's like, it's like putting poison into your body. It is, it's like blood poisoning with alcohol, alcohol blood poisoning. And that is very similar to what is happening with our climate. Now to take that to another metaphor, um, you know, the temperature of your body. So um, when we talk about, uh, you know, the te what, is the what is the temperature for a healthy human body? 36.5. 36.5, yeah. So, you know, you're feeling fine, right? But if we, we increase the temperature to 36, 37, half, half a degree, how are you feeling? Easy. Yeah. And what if we increase it another half a, half a degree, a full degree? How are you feeling now? You're at um, 37.5. Very bad. Do you want to come to class? No. No. Yeah. And let's let's just increase it to two. Let's increase it two C. We'll increase it to thirty eight point five. How are you feeling now? Dying. Yeah. I think you want to go <laughs> see a doctor. Maybe. All right. Let's increase it to three C. How are you feeling? We're at 30. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your brain is going to boil, okay? It's going to, it's actually going to melt down and you're going to get brain damage and then die. So a very small change in a biological system has huge effects. And this is a really important thing for Koreans, anyone throughout the world to understand. Um, it's not about outside physical space temperature. It's, it's actually about biological system. The earth is a biological system. Your body is a biological system. Um, you know, another metaphor that I like to use, um, and this is a little bit different. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll, sh I'll share that later. So let's move on. And um, let me just, you guys kind of basically understand the greenhouse effect. Is there anyone that doesn't understand the greenhouse effect and how it works? Okay, so the, the sun comes in and then some of it goes back out. It reflects off of like ice, white ice, but w the, the oceans are very dark. And so the color really makes a big difference on how much heat is trapped. Um, scientists call this albedo, everyone, albedo. And albedo is, a, a, it's a level of reflect, reflectivity. 
So the higher the albedo, the more reflection, like on ice is a good example, but the oceans are, you know, the world, the earth is actually, it shouldn't be called earth, it should be called water, because we have mostly water, but because we don't live in the water, we call it earth. <laughs> so we actually, the earth, the, the oceans absorb a lot of uh, the heat because they're dark color. And one of the great things about the ice is that it reflects a lot of the heat. It's like our air conditioning system because it's white. So um, when we lose the ice, we kind of lose our air conditioning system. Uh, but what happens here is that some, you can see here that some of, some of the actual uh, light is not, be, not going out and some is staying. And this is uh, an important part of measuring climate and uh, how uh, um, certain molecules trap heat and what affects uh, the trapping of heat. So albedo is one factor and greenhouse gases are others, which are the most important. So this is a video about uh, how greenhouse gases really work and how they trap heat. Um, if you were to take a infrared camera, let's say, um, let's say this, this is an infrared camera right here, and you have a candle right here, and you put CO2 right here, the infrared camera cannot see the candle anymore because it is trapping the heat. It is, is actually, it's like, a, it's like an invisible wall where you cannot actually see the heat anymore. It traps that heat. And you can do that with other gases as well. It's a great science experiment, actually. Um, just as a side note, um, the, where I learned that was in a BBC documentary that was actually taken off the internet because the, the documentary was so effective that it was changing people's attitudes and minds. And I contacted the, the author in it and he, would, he wouldn't actually return my tweets. Um, and I think it was because of the fossil fuel industry. They didn't want him actually talking about climate change. This was like years ago. So here is a picture of the carbon cycle. And you can see this is all measured in gigatons of carbon. And uh, you have certain things that are emitting carbon and certain things that are absorbing it. Let me say to you that 90% of all of our carbon emissions are going into the oceans. This is really bad because any, anyone who's in physical science knows that it's really, it takes a lot of energy to heat water, right? So once you heat the water, it's really hard to cool it down. And what's happening with our global biosphere is that the oceans are saving, saving our ass, basically. If we didn't have the oceans, we'd already be dead or we, we would have um, solved the problem probably we'd be dead. Um, but the oceans are actually our mother and they're actually taking care of us and they're absorbing this and they're acidifying as a count of it. So right now, um, the coral reefs are dying at a really, really fast rate. Um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia is like, I think, mostly dead at this point. Um, and uh, shellfish are having a a harder and harder time surviving because of the acidification of their shells. Um, the future organism that will thrive in the oceans are jellyfish. So, um, you know, I'm a big supporter of Beyond Meat uh, because meat is such a big uh, carbon intensive product. Um, but jellyfish, I, I don't think we could eat jellyfish. Um, but they are thriving in the, in the world's oceans right now. Um, okay, so the, this is the carbon cycle and just like what Elon Musk says and what all other scientists say is we're out of balance in our carbon cycle and we just got to restore the balance. So um, sometimes you'll get people who say, you know, climate change is not real and it's not really happening. And I used to actually engage with them uh, about the science, but I just ignore them now uh, because it's like trying to argue that the earth is flat and that gravity doesn't exist. And I'm just like, you know, I have better ways to spend my time. Um, so just for you, just in case you ever wanna engage with those people, um, here are just five areas which no one can argue with, that if you, if you are measuring 
um, land temperature with a thermometer, you can see that the, there is a warming trend. Satellite temperatures also confirm that there is a warming trend. Satellites also show that the ice is melting and you can, you can easily see it in videos on YouTube and measure it and you can go visit it if you want to. I was in New Zealand in 2015, 2014 and I flew over the Fox Glacier in New Zealand and it was totally disintegrating. In fact, all the glaciers in New Zealand were melting when I was there, all of them. The biggest one was in a giant lake, it had created a giant lake in New Zealand. The ocean heat content is increasing and it's now starting to affect the deeper layers of the ocean, which is very worrisome. And of course, sea level rise is increasing. How many millimeters per year? Thank you. Uh, um, that was uh, Minjung. Thank you, Minjung. Excellent. High five. All right. So, um, you know, you just can't debate it anymore. It's undebatable. And if anyone debates it, they're just like idiots, basically. I mean, or just misinformed. So um, this is a really powerful video I'm going to show you guys. This is um, NASA's. Um, this is heat from 1880 to the present. And they're just taking basic temperature readings and accumulating them over time. And they're doing it in 30 seconds. They're showing you how the warming trend has accelerated. There we go. You were born. <laughs> and I, I came to Yonsei. Wait, let's go back. Hold on. I just want to. I just want to go back to, uh, let's see here, 1970. Can we, can we do 1970? No. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Oh, 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 oh. Come, come back. Okay. So, so here's 1986, 1990. I'm, I'm uh, uh, graduating from high school. Okay. Here we go. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, I just got married for the first time. Oh, got divorced. And now I just came to Korea. Oh my goodness. Okay. So there we go. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, okay, so moving on, um, here, we, here we have uh, the 10 hottest years since 1998. Now, take a look at this. This is, this is kind of interesting. Um, what we can see here is we can see, oops, let's, uh, we can see here that um, uh, pretty, pretty much um, there's, nothing in the 19, there's nothing in the 20th century. It's all, it's all 21st century. And uh, as, as we have more, actually 2017, 2018, 2019, while they weren't the hottest years, they're like, you know, really close. They're like second, third, you know, fourth hottest years. They're not like cold. Um, so uh, there's that. Now, um, one of the cool things that NASA can do now with their satellites, and they are launching more and more really amazing satellites that can monitor Earth's vital signs. Just like we do in the hospital with your pulse and your blood pressure and your heart rate and your brain scan and your, your we, can, we can take all these measurements. We can do the same thing with the Earth. So I wanna share this video with you. Um, it's, it's really amazing because you get to see the Earth breathing in and breathing out in what it happens in an uh, uh, annual cycle. So the earth, you know, she's old, uh, billions of years. And when she, you know, one year, six months is like breathing in and six months is like breathing out. Hi, this is Bill Putman. I'm a climate scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Can you hear this? Okay, so this is Bill Goddard, uh, I'm sorry, Bill Putman from Goddard Space Institute. That's where the best scientists that do climate work uh, work. Uh, the Goddard Space Institute, or GISS. That's next to Columbia University in New York City. What you're looking at is a supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere. The visualization compresses one year of data into a few minutes. Carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas affected by human activity. About half of the carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuel combustion remains in the atmosphere, while the other half is absorbed by natural land and ocean reservoirs. 
In the Northern Hemisphere, we see the highest concentrations are focused around major emission sources over North America, Europe, and Asia. Notice how the gas doesn't stay in one place. The dispersion of carbon dioxide is controlled by the large-scale weather patterns within the global circulation. During spring and summer in the Northern Hemisphere, plants absorb a substantial amount of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, thus removing some of the gas from the atmosphere. We see this change in the model as the red and purple colors start to fade. Meanwhile, in the Southern Hemisphere, we see the release of another pollutant, carbon monoxide. This is a gas that's both harmful to the environment and to humans. During the summer months, plumes of carbon monoxide stream from fires in Africa, South America, and Australia, contributing to high concentrations in the atmosphere. Notice how these emissions are also transported by winds to other parts of the world. As summer transitions to fall and plant photosynthesis decreases, carbon dioxide begins to accumulate in the atmosphere. Although this change is expected, we're seeing higher concentrations of carbon dioxide accumulate in the atmosphere each year. This is contributing to the long-term trend of rising global temperatures. The Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2, will be the first NASA satellite mission to provide a global view of carbon dioxide. OCO2 observations and atmospheric models like GEOS-5 will work closely together to better understand both human emissions and natural fluxes of carbon dioxide. This will help guide climate models toward more reliable predictions of future conditions across the globe. All right, cool. So NASA has really wonderful uh, visualizations, which make uh, 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 understanding climate change so much easier. Um, and especially like fighting forest fires, they can see actually what's being cut down in real time. I mean, there's so many amazing things that are happening in that area. All right. So um, this video is about surface temperatures of the sea. And Noah, uh, not my my son's name is Noah, but this is a different Noah. Uh, this is the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. They made a visualization of warming sea temperatures from 1985 to 2006, and you can see this is for South Korea. Uh, do you see South Korea right here? This is 1985. Look at it right now, in 2006, and those temperatures have even changed more in the last. 15 years. So that's why on Jeju, you have kiwi and banana, mango and papaya starting to be being grown. Okay. Whereas that could never have happened before. And every year, I think, I think it's about uh, 30 kilometers. Uh, species are moving 30 kilometers a year northward. And I saw, I think it was a, an article in Nature that trees can't move that fast. So basically what we're looking at is a mass extinction, uh, not extinction, but a mass kill event of all trees on the globe because they cannot survive in the, in the climate zone that they're in. And that would happen within uh, about um, 40 years. And it's already happening. In my home state of Oregon, uh, we have massive forest fires and all over California and um, uh, uh, British Columbia as well, there are massive forest fires, especially in the summertime. So um, I want to introduce you guys to Dr. Keeling. Everyone, Dr. Keeling. <laughs> David Keeling. He was this professor, you know, at Scripps. Scripps is one of the most famous universities for studying the oceans, and it's in California and um, San Diego. 
and he was working there in 1950s. And he was just, you know, his hob scientists have weird hobbies, you know, it's like, they're really nerds, you know, they're like Bill Gates, you know, hey, I'm going to do decent programming. It's Friday night, you know, and, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, David Keeling, his hobby was to measure CO2 in atmospheric concentrations on Mauna Loa. And that was his like thing, right? And so he was up on Mauna Loa and he's like recording this, you know, year after year after year, doing his, he's, he's geeking out on CO2 in the air. And he notices something. He notices that, oh my gosh, it's going up. It's not just staying stable. It's, it's actually going up. There's a, you know, it's high in the summer and it goes down in the winter, just like you saw in that image, right? Just in the NASA uh, visualization. The earth is breathing, breathing in, breathing out. But notice what's happening. It's getting warmer and warmer as that CO2 starts to accumulate and accumulate. And he became very famous as a scientist. And they called it, they call it now the Keeling curve. Okay. And when we talk about 413, oh, I, I was going to test you again. How many ppm do we have today in the atmosphere? 413. 13. Very good. All right. Excellent. Um, that's right. 413 ppm. Now, um, it's going up. It's really nice to, to think about, like what we were talking about before, how, how many years does it take us to get to the next 10 ppm. And it's like every five years, it's going up 10 ppm. Um, in 2017, it was about 3.4 ppm per year. Um, and we can measure this. And it's very interesting. You know, you, you start to see these numbers and you start to realize, wow, this is, this is, uh, is kind of crazy. So let's move on. Okay, so everyone, this is famous climate scientist Michael E. Mann. Everyone, Michael E. Mann. And he was kind of, you know, he wasn't really famous until uh, climate deniers attacked his science work. And they called it the hockey stick. Uh, and a hockey stick, er, you guys all know hockey? Yeah. You, uh, you know, the game where they, they do on the ice, you know, with the hockey puck. And the, it, it kind of goes like this, and then suddenly it shoots up, right? The, the hockey stick is flat here, and then it shoots up. And you can kind of see here that it has a similar kind of shoot. And they attacked him really hard and said that he is uh, lying. He's, you know, um, manipulating the numbers. Um, but today, actually, it's, it's, there's no doubt that what he was saying was true. And actually there's more evidence today than there has ever been to confirm this theory uh, or hypothesis, which is now a confirmed fact, um, which is that um, based on all these different forms of evidence, some of which my brother collects using cacti and rat poop or what's called rat midden and cacti and looking at all sorts of really, really old trees, we can see that the temperature is actually warming. And you can, there's a video here if you ever want to watch that, which is about what happened and the controversy behind Michael E. Mann and uh, his book called The Madhouse and what's happening with the Trump administration versus Obama. And the fossil fuel industry is actually financed Trump uh, to help him win. That was the Heritage Institute and the, the, uh, the Koch brothers uh, Heartland Institute. They actually uh, were um, given permission by Trump to take over uh, and, and staff the U.S. government. And they're the biggest climate deniers in the world. So here we have a timeline history of CO2. And I think this is kind of an interesting way. You can see here that it's, it's, a, it's actually, we're seeing the same Keeling curve, but this is the temperature reading that results from CO2 and other gases. So this is how fast the temperature is actually rising. And we can see we're getting some years, it's, it's, it's rising uh, a little bit faster than others. And this finishes in 
2015. And that was the hottest year on record to date. And we can see we're trying to keep temperature under 1.5, right? Look at how close in some years that is already getting. It's pretty, pretty darn close. We can see here, this is another visualization. I love these visualizations. They really help you understand. This is by country, the temperature anomalies. So you can see this is 1935, 1942, World War II, Korean War. Oh my gosh, industrialization in Korea. Park Chung-hee, Chung doo Han. Oh, Kim Dae-jung. Oh my gosh, professor went to college. Oh, he just came to Korea. Oh my gosh. He, now he started work at Yonsei. Oh, he started Wisecan. All right. So you can see the change, right? You can see it in this one as well. And there are lots of fun ones to do it. This is one of my favorite visualizations. This is actually the history of CO2 going back like close to a million years. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. Actually, 400,000. So we'll take a look. And you can see we're starting here in 1979. This is me, okay, again, high school. I just went to the high school prom. All right, 1989. We're at, we're, we're at 350 ppm. 350, oh my gosh. Okay, we had the great financial crisis, the IMF crisis. We're at 360 and we're cruising. And now we're at 2005 and we're, oh my gosh, we're almost at 400. Mauna Loa is the place where a lot of scientific measurements are done, but it's done all over the world now. Now we're going to head backwards in time, and we're going to go historical um, back hundreds of years. Now you can see here, notice here, this is where everything gets started, is in the 1800s when the Industrial Revolution begins, right? Which makes sense, 1850, 1800, right around in here. But now, oh my God, let's go back to the time of Jesus. Oh my gosh, we're going too fast. So um, uh, let me just go back a little bit here. You can see here, um, it goes back to, uh, you know, Columbus discovered America, blah, 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 or actually invaded it. And then going back, um, you can see here's, Jesus was born, okay? And look, it's at 280. This is con widely considered the baseline for climate science. In, in atmospheric research. Okay, now we're gonna go back a few hundred thousand years. Now this is 150,000 years, 300,000 years. I'm sorry, yeah. So now we're going back really far. Okay, now one of the things you'll notice here, we're going back to ice age. An ice age is about 185 ppm. So look at this, we go back 800,000 years. The baseline that's traditionally used is right here, 280, but actually I think it should be more like in the middle here. It should be more like around 240. young -Hoo, I'd, I'd like you to do a research paper on this. Why do they use 280? Why can't we use 240? Because it looks like we're almost about to double CO2 concentrations on average over the last millions of years. It's kind of interesting. I just have this like, it's my, it's my little thing that bothers me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I just love that video. I'm geeking out on, on CO2 visualizations. Um, this is a time-lapse history of CO2 emissions um, since 1935 and the spread of uh, fossil fuel coal. But we don't, we don't have time for that, so I'm going to skip it. All right, so now we're getting into like how many gigatons uh, of CO2 equivalent emissions do we emit? Now this is this little E right here, this is really important because usually when you hear like how many tons of CO2 have we emitted, what's our carbon budget, you have to include all the greenhouse gases. Um, you need to include CO2 but, and you need to include CH4, you need to include nitrous oxide, um, you need to include water vapor and CH, uh, HCFCs. I want to talk about water for a minute. Um, a lot of students are like, water? Really? Water is a greenhouse gas? Why is water a greenhouse gas? Well, as the Earth's atmosphere warms up and heats, um, water traps more heat. Because, I mean, just think about it, uh, like a, a, a humid summer day 
versus a dry summer day? Which, which do you think is going to be better, a dry summer day or a humid summer day? A dry one. Yeah, a dry one. And that's because there's, it's, there's not so much moisture. If you have a lot of moisture, you get humidity. And humidity is the death sentence for uh, productivity. Um, as soon as you start getting that humidity, humans slow down. And we, we have something called the wet bulb temperature. What is wet bulb temperature? Wet bulb temperature simply means that you have to include humidity and temperature. You can't just look at temperature. Because when you're talking about humans doing work outside, not in air conditioning, uh, the wet bulb temperature is actually, even though the temperature might say, you know, 35, 40 C, when you add the humidity, the temperature totally changes and it goes up a lot. So um, when you're thinking about um, how hot it is outside and, and you need to think about humidity with temperature. And that's why uh, H2O is an important heat trapping gas. Um, if you, another metaphor to use is the sauna. If you've ever been in a sauna and you throw water on the rocks and it goes and you're like, oh my God, and you drop to the floor. It's a similar effect. So, um, you know, while it's not actually, you know, a heat trapping gas in the traditional sense of like CO2, CH4, and nitrous and sulfur oxides, um, water vapor is huge uh, greenhouse gas, one of the biggest actually. So, um, in 1990, we were emitting around 23 gigatons of CO2 emissions. Um, uh, now, I got a lot of this from uh, NASA, and actually these are done over a long period of time. And if you want to update these and make them even more accurate, I welcome your input uh, because they might not be perfectly accurate. Uh, they might have some errors, but the, you get the general idea. The general idea is that we went from 23 gigatons to 26 gigatons over these 10 years. And then over these 10 years, we went up another 4 gigatons. And then in just two years, we went up one gigaton. And in, an, in these three years, we went up three, four is about four gigatons. And this is how many gigatons each year we're putting out. Okay. This is not accumulated gigatons. This is how much we emit on an annual basis. So um, here we have, uh, we're, we're, we're going from here to here, we've gone up six gigatons. Actually, I'm sorry, no, wait, we're not even 10 years out. We've gone from 2010 to 2017, we've gone up 11 gigatons. Today, we are emitting more gigatons annually in the history of human civilization. Okay. It is really a bad situation. Um, now, COVID-19 has, students will ask, uh, is COVID-19 affecting this? It is a little bit, but when you realize how massive our accumulated emissions are and how big our actual fossil fuel infrastructure is, it's actually not going down very much. And what we have to do to bend the curve down is actually we have to have uh, COVID lockdowns every year for the next 20 years. So that, that's not gonna work. <laughs> All right, so coming, uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about carbon budgets. So our carbon budget has been about 600 gigatons since 2012. Now there's a lot of debates about carbon budgets and what is the actual carbon budget and there are many different models. I'm just choosing one of them, the one that I think is the best to use. And um, we have about, we've had 506, uh, 595 gigatons since 2012, but between 2012 and 2017, we had about 227 gigatons, which means that we will exhaust the budget in between five to six years. Before COVID-19, it was about seven years, according to Michael Mann. Um, the green, the sunrise movement in the United States was saying we have about seven years. Um, 
And you know, it's, it's ironic as a professor, I watched this go down and down and down. And every year, I remember when it was 10 years or 12 years, and now it's down to, you know, like seven, eight years. COVID-19, I think we, we're waiting for the results of that and nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen. But it's running out faster and faster. And uh, you can see, this is an IPCC uh, chart, which is showing um, uh, carbon, uh, I think it's uh, CO2 emissions, not equivalent. Um, oh, so moving on. So I like to kind of, I think it's hard for most average students to try to comprehend how much heat we're actually putting into the atmosphere through our fossil fuel emissions and other accumulated CO2 equivalent emissions when you add everything in. And I think a, a really good, now I wouldn't do this if we had any, do we have any uh, Japanese in our audience? I don't like to do this if we have anyone from Japan, but I like to use this as an equivalent because um, it's a, it, 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 it really has parallels. Uh, you know, nuclear war is the number two most greatest threat on Earth um, besides climate change. Climate change is number one. It used to be number two, and it's just kind of gradually gone up. Nuclear war is another one. So I, I think this is a very appropriate metaphor for uh, the danger that we face as a global, global civilization. And a single atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima is about 20 thousand tons of TNT. And everybody knows TNT, it's dynamite. And I want to show you what that looks like. So this tragically is 80,000 people dying in about 20 seconds. That's a huge amount of energy released in a very short amount of time. And, you know, for all my Sunung Master students, uh, I asked them, you know, if one ton of TNT equals 4,184,000,000 joules of energy, 20,000 tons of TNT equals 83,680,000,000,000 joules, just one bomb. So, How many Hiroshima's of heat are added to our global climate each minute? And you guys, I think, let's see what you guys guessed. I, I know none of you had any idea. <laughs> so don't feel bad if you get the wrong answer. So um, the answer is 240 a minute. So it's going like this. It's going like this. Can you imagine? like an extraterrestrial alien civilization launching missiles at the Earth, going boom, 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 like that. So here's the counter. This is, is kind of the, uh, um, now the Earth is huge, right? It's really big and it can absorb a lot of the heat, but the Earth is not infinite. It can't absorb that much. So uh, this is kind of the uh, amount of heat when you're, when you're emitting 41 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, it is gonna change the climate. And so we are quickly changing the climate. We have superpowers like no other. And uh, with that superpower comes responsibility. So it's, it's just mind boggling. I, I mean, I just, I look at these uh, statistics and I'm like, geez, that, that is just like, we're at war with ourselves. If you ever want the data for this, I, I'll, I'd be happy to give it to you and you can research it yourself and make sure that it's correct. It's, it's really quite shocking. Um, so I wanna um, move to the cryosphere, everyone, cryosphere. This, this word means uh, all the ice on Earth. You know, we have the atmosphere, right, for air, and we have the oceans, but we also look at the ice, and people who study the ice, they study the cryosphere. And 
This is from Dr. Richard Alley, um, his research at University of Pennsylvania. That's where Michael Mann also is. Uh, it's an Ivy League school. And um, this is a really shocking fact. You're going to, this is, hold on to your seats. So if heating was limited to 400 ppm, this is just, remember, we're at 413, right? In the atmosphere, sea levels would rise 15 meters within 300 years. Okay. If you look here, here's the ppm. This is the sea level rise in meters. Okay. We are here right now. This is 10% of the world's population is going to be underwater with the ppm that we have already today. Songdo, underwater. 15 meters, forget it, Songdo's gone. It's just gonna, how long will it take for the water to rise? My wife's hagwon, underwater. So uh, I want you to know that it's, and actually with regards to the Arctic, okay, we're gonna, let's, let's talk, where is the ice? Most of you said the Arctic, that is correct. Um, so from 1800 to 1900, we had one millimeter of sea level rise per year. From 1900 to 1950, two millimeters. So it, it went up 100%. Then from, uh, it went up three millimeters. So we're looking at a gradual increase. But look at this. This is what I want you to look at. From 2000 to 2017, it went up 3.5 millimeters. And we're still there right now. The question that everyone is asking right now is when is it going to start going up faster? Because we can see the ice melting in Greenland and we can see the ice melting in Antarctica and that's where most of the ice is. So the Arctic has zero meters of sea level rise. Remember that, okay? <laughs> if an ice cube is in the water already and it melts, it doesn't raise the glass. But one thing that does raise the glass is heat. So if you put a glass in a microwave and you heat it up, the level will go up. So one of the big factors of sea level rise is actually a warming sea. As the, warm get, as the sea gets warmer, it expands and actually raises sea level. That's something that most people don't think about, but that is a very big contributor to sea level rise. So Greenland has about six and a half, seven meters of ice. Remember, this ice is like five kilometers high. I mean, it's like huge. And uh, the whole of Greenland is covered in it, mostly. And then, but look at this, Antarctica, 60 meters. So where are you going to look for sea level uh, rise? You're going to be looking in Antarctica. So the total is between 66 and a half, maybe 70 meters of sea level rise. Total, if all the ice melts, we're looking at about 67, 70 meters of sea level rise over 100, 200, 300 years. Okay, so this is a video that, and we don't have very much time left. Um, I want to finish on time. Uh, this is from a very famous documentary called Chasing Ice, which was James Belog, the photographer for National Geographic, wanted to capture the melting ice uh, and so he put together a documentary called Chasing Ice, and his team were able to capture the largest calving event in the history of recorded video. And what is calving? Calving, you know, like the, the Alaska, you're on a cruise ship and you're going by the glaciers and you have your binoculars and you're watching the ice fall off the glacier into the water and it's like, oh my God! Look at that. Oh, it's so cool. It's, so, it's chimita. You know, it's fun. You get to watch the ice fall off the glacier into the water and you get to watch it go. Woo! This is fun. Well, this is what they found. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check ins. Jim, just nothing's happening. Uh, it's going well. We had uh, some serious bouts of wind, but other than that, things are fairly well set up. We've got some time left. Today. It's starting, Adam. I think Adam is starting. By the way, these two cameramen have been sitting there for two weeks.
when this happens. Nothing is happening. And then suddenly, now. Okay, back. Yeah, and that B section right there. Holy shit, look at that big bird rolling. Shockwave of like a bomb. Cavity faces 300, sometimes 400 feet tall. Pieces of ice were shooting up out of the ocean 600 feet that had fallen. Two hundred meters high. The only way that you can really try to put it into scale with human reference is if you imagine Manhattan. All of a sudden, all of those buildings just start to rumble and quake and peel off and just fall over, fall over, roll around. This whole massive city just breaking apart in front of your eyes. We're just observers. These two little dots on the side of the mountain. We watched and recorded the largest witness calving event ever caught on tape. So it took 75 minutes for that to happen. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations. This is James Bullock. A sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and the horror of that. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. All right, cool. So, um, wow, um, this is a video of like what happens if all the ice melts. <laughs> oh my God, where's New Orleans? Where's Houston? <laughs> and there's a whole bunch of other cities, uh, maybe where you're from, that are underwater as well. This is my hometown, Portland. Not quite underwater, but close. Yeah, 70 meters when you think about that, wow. So I want to uh, I want to just leave you guys with uh, a cheery thought. Um, this is methane uh, in the permafrost, which is 
one of the scariest uh, issues out there in climate science. There are so many gigatons, you know, like a like huge amounts of uh, methane trapped inside the permafrost. And if it actually gets out, um, it can cause a uh, destabilization of the carbon cycle very quickly because we all know methane uh, is much worse than CO2, right? So the question is, how fast will it come out? And most scientists say it will be actually a slow process, uh, but we, we're starting to see um, uh, destabilization in the northern latitudes of the permafrost. So this is going to be something that we all need to keep a close eye on and watch very carefully. And we don't really have time to watch the video. It's fun. You can watch them poke holes in the lake and set, set it on fire. Um, so we really actually, at this point, we need negative emissions. We can't just stop emitting carbon dioxide. We actually have to um, remove carbon dioxide from the air and the oceans. And we're probably not going to remove it from the oceans, but we need to find ways to remove it from the air. And there's a lot of technologies for that, um, which include um, afforestation, planting massive forests all over the world, and a lot of other solutions involved. Now, this lecture doesn't cover the solutions, but I just do want to tell you that, um, you know, like with Elon Musk uh, and Tesla, um, and uh, solar and wind and um, all of these uh, um, solutions in all of these different areas have huge uh, effects. And the problem today is not technological. The problem today is political because the solutions to solve the problem are largely mostly there already. Um, so I'll give you an example at Yonsei. I've worked at Yonsei to try to decarbonize the campus system. And the, the university president is very hesitant to do it because um, he won't say why. Um, but my guess is that uh, our honorary board, of, uh, chairman of the board of trustees is the CEO of GS Caltech, which is one of the largest oil companies in, in the nation. And the fossil fuel industry, like in the United States, is also very powerful here in South Korea. So, you know, Yonsei prides itself as a university which is uh, liberal and wants to do a lot of good for humanity and does. And at the same time, we have this shadow a little bit of uh, fossil fuels. So how GS Caltech and other companies transition to a renewable energy economy is very important. And one of the big factors in South Korea is synthetic synthetic gas and green hydrogen. And this is going to be a huge player in South Korea's energy transition because South Korea doesn't have a lot of uh, open space for solar and it doesn't have the best quality wind. So we have to find ways in which to decarbonize South Korea that use uh, best in class technologies. Some of which don't quite exist yet, uh, which are synthetic fuels and green hydrogen, but the price is coming down just like it has with solar and wind and battery storage. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there uh, and just take any questions you guys might have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Do, do any of you have any questions or comments or anything you'd like to share? Comment is that I'm scared now. <laughs> really scared. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that Minjung? Yep. Yeah. It is very scary. And um, I've had to deal a lot with my home fear. Um, I think that's the thing that actually brings you into the activism is the fear um, and wanting to overcome it. And, but a, a lot of people, uh, when, you, when you see it, um, it kind of grabs you, you know. And I couldn't, there, when I first learned about this, I couldn't sleep for a few days. I, I couldn't eat or sleep. I think Greta Thunberg, you know Greta Thunberg, the Swedish girl who kind of galvanized the climate movement? she went through a similar process um, where she wouldn't talk for a long time and she wouldn't eat and she was in mourning. And that mourning process is a very natural psychological phenomena which helps you or reorient yourself to a new reality. And so I don't, I don't wanna discourage you from being scared because it is scary. 
I'm, I'm not going to deny it. It's, it's terrifying. You, you, the war on terror, you want, you want terror? Uh, look at this. I mean, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen next to maybe an alien invasion. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I do want to tell you that all the solutions there, Minjung, are, are present. And uh, it's just a matter of political will. So I'll give you an example. In Korea, since you're Korean, I, I think you're Korean. Yeah. Uh, KEPCO is an obstacle. Um, the government owns most of KEPCO and could nationalize the company and turn it into a renewable energy powerhouse. Uh, the, the thing that's tricky about that is that there are a lot of investors who also own KEPCO. And how do you uh, wrestle with that? Also, uh, Korea is highly dependent on coal uh, power plants. And many of those coal power plants are uneconomic and uh, will be retired early. And the investors that own those, some of which I think S uh, S uh, GS Caltex owns, uh, will lose money from that investment. It'll become what we call a stranded asset. So there is a battle uh, being played out, especially in the United States right now, uh, the fossil fuel companies at the federal level have won. And now the battle has gone to the states where most of the energy policy is made at the state level, not at the federal level. Um, so um, some countries are, some uh, states are advancing very quickly and others are just, you know, staying far behind. Now, let me, let me just say that um, globally, um, China and India alone could solve this problem because most of the future emissions are going to be in those countries and they're supposed to be coal. And guess what's happened? In both countries, coal has become uneconomic un and solar is winning and wind is winning. So I want you to, I, wa I don't want you to, actually when I teach climate, um, I've, I've learned that actually it's better to teach the solutions first and the science second for this very reason. I don't want you to leave this meeting feeling scared and disempowered and immobilized. I want you to actually leave this uh, um, webinar or lecture empowered and feeling that you can actually take action and you can do something about it. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do at Yonsei by organizing students and faculty to support YSCAN and to grow it, um, bring other faculty into YSCAN to support it financially and with their time. Um, and there's so many things that we can do that we're not doing. And, and so the first step is, is getting scared, real, really realizing, oh my God, this is, this is something that we need to, <laughs> we, need to, we, need to we need to get on this problem. Uh, <laughs> it's a problem, we, we gotta solve this problem. And um, once, you, once you make the decision to actually get involved, you know, never underestimate the power of a small group of people. It can actually change the world. And if everybody thinks like that, we can really make a big difference. Any other comments or questions or? Hey, Tamo, good to see you again. Valeria, I, why don't you show your beautiful face? And if this goes, I mean, this probably will go to an SMS. So I, no. I see. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Camille, so good to see you. Gina. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so I'm yours if you, if you wanna, we can finish now or if you got other comments or questions or anything. Okay, so I think we'll finish here. Thank you everyone. I really appreciate you being here and uh, being witness to the science and um, some of the solutions. And I hope that, uh, you know, this was helpful and useful for you. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Professor, you. for the information. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope to uh, uh, hear uh, all the wonderful things you're doing soon. I know it's really hard with COVID-19. Oh, one, one thing in closing is that um, the link between COVID-19 and climate change, they are linked. Um, the link is in deforestation. Uh, when you cut down uh, a diverse rainforest, it forces humans and animals into contact. And 
one of the things in, in China that could have happened uh, or in other places is that when you're disturbing the ecological balance and cutting down forests, it forces the bats to move to another location. And what happens then is they, they might fly over the Wuhan food market and, you know, go to the toilet on some, you know, wet meat. And then who knows what, and then they can transfer the virus to the people that are working on that. And I, I want to say that um, the biodiversity issue, you know, um, how we treat forests uh, is, a, is a very important issue in climate change. So what we need to do is increase the biodiversity on our current system. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, our campus system is very much in the tradition of kind of the French. Uh, 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 you can manipulate nature and make it look aesthetically pleasing. Um, but one of the things that we really need to be thinking about is how much carbon emissions go into maintaining that. You know, I routinely go out into the Yonsei campus and I see guys with these, you know, um, uh, gasoline powered, you know, blowers and trimmers and all these things. And um, I'm wondering, wouldn't it be amazing to design a landscape that didn't require much maintenance and also maybe even provided some food? Um, uh, like a permaculture type design landscape or one that that had a specific intention to sequester carbon. Like for example here in Songdo we have so much vacant land it's not being used why don't we just plant some trees in it? You know before before the 15 meters of sea level rise. <laughs> I'll take it over. Uh, this is also I think the country's in denial. Uh, I I think most most nations are in denial about um, that most places that they have built um, within those 15 meters will be underwater within we don't know what's going to happen you know within the next hundred years so it's it's impossible to predict um, what kind of new technologies will develop or whatnot but I can tell you um, that this is a manageable problem that we can we can solve it and uh but it really requires uh everyone coming together to make it happen all right you guys have a great weekend and you know if you ever have questions or emails you can young who knows how to get a hold of me and um we could create a cacao group and i'm happy to i, I actually in the past i used to be in the cacao group but i think elena ejected me or asked me to leave because sometimes i can be a little bit annoying or something, you know, posting like five things every day or something. I don't, I don't know what it is. But anyway, I'm, I'm committed to not being annoying in the future. And uh, if you, if I ever get annoying, just tell me, Hajima, you know, chocolate. <laughs> okay. So uh, I really want a sustainable relationship. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. So anything I can do to support you guys, just let me know, um, including you. Don't be shy to ask for money. Okay. And uh, also, um, uh, don't be shy to ask other professors for money, too, to support the work. There are 2,000 professors at Yonsei. I'm sure 1% would be happy to donate. Don't, don't be shy. Don't be bold. Be bold. I mean, you, you've got the whole, you've got Mother Earth at your back supporting you. That's a, that's a big, big mama. <laughs> big mama. <laughs> She's got your back. She's got your back. I'm telling you. So um, one other thing that I've thought about, since you guys don't want to leave, um, is having a, like a, when, when the COVID numbers go down, you know, we've got it, we got it, we got it under control, is I want to have a, 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 you know, Y-Scan party at my place in Songdo. I've got this huge apartment with lots of food and no one to share it with. So I would love to host a, a dinner party, you know, we'll have, we'll, we'll just have a feast and we'll all sit around listening to really fun climate change music. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, no beef, only chicken. 
and um, uh, and we'll kind of, we can have a potluck party, and I'll go to Costco and stock up, and you know, really, we'll, we'll have we'll have a great time. So anyway, that's one idea, uh, you know, to kind of get over the pandemic. And then also, there's a lot of things that you guys can be doing uh, with regard strategy strategizing on Zoom. Um, to uh, to kind of, I know we can't do very much because nobody's on campus and stuff. But uh, there's actually a lot of things you can be doing personally to educate yourself. This being a great one. Okay, my wife is probably wondering where is he. <laughs> I'm in my office. Here, I'll, I'll take out the visual background. This will be kind of, oops, hold on. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. You can see my office. There we go. Ha <laughs> ha. Can you see it? Oh, there we go. That's my office. Actually, that's kind of better. You can see the bridge to the, 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 the organic bridge to the tree. Let me see it. It's really, there we go. Oh, no, 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 no. So fun. <sighs> All right, you guys. You know, get to talk a lot together, you know, about these issues and what you can do. And um, I have lots of video, documentary videos that I can share with you and books um, to educate yourself. Um, and I can save you a lot of time. So anyone wants to leave? Okay, I, I, let's go. Let's go. I don't, 